Hello everyone, how are you doing today? I'm going to be talking about feature flags, the art of the if, and deployment. So my name is Chris Ayers. I am a senior customer success engineer at Microsoft. Now I've recently moved to Microsoft, but prior to that, I was a consultant. I'd been in the consulting field for about seven years. Um, I've been developing pretty much my entire life though, since second grade in the 80s. And um, I've always been really interested in technology and the capabilities that new technology brings us. Um, you can see my ways to contact me and follow me, including my blog and my GitHub. So let's move on and dive into, well, what are future flags? Why use them? What does deployment look like versus a release? How can we operationalize our feature flags? And finally, let's get in the demos. Let's look at some code. So what are feature flags? Well, let me, let me give you an example in code now. Um, let's say we have a method, some type of functionality that does stuff. It takes some parameters, does some things, it returns that result. Let's get a feature request. You know, Our business owner, our product owner, they really want us to do some cool things, maybe with unicorns, I don't know. So we're gonna start using this new algorithm that we're writing, but you know it's not always ready. Like it's not gonna be ready on the first check-in. So we wanna maybe you know, just have a flag in the code for when we're, we're using it or not. I mean, this is one way to look at a feature toggle or a feature flag. I mean, it's just an if. Um, so if we're using it and it's uncommented, we're going to go into our new implementation. Otherwise, we're just going to keep doing the same old thing. Now we've added maybe an extra call in there, but for the most part, we haven't really changed anything. But, you know, let's look at the heart of this, the root of this. You know, this feature flags, is it enabled? This, this could come from anywhere. This could be, um, this is a configuration value with Booleans, true, false, yes, no, on, off. So we could have this be a service. This could be a feature of the code or a library. Um, we could do this through configuration, through code changes, or, or through that service. And you know, this is where we start getting into what feature flags really are and where the power comes from. Because we don't want to have to make a code change every time we want to turn it on or off. We want to abstract that away from our code base. So why are we going to start putting ifs in our code all over the place? Well, feature flags have different uses, and these uses are why they're so powerful. You know, it does lead to code separation. We can start separating our implementations very easily. Um, in the past, maybe we did it through dependency injection, and we would inject different versions, but now um, we have more control, and um, I'll dive into that later. By using feature flags, we can have partial implementations that aren't done yet, or we can experiment. So we can minimize our disruption to our customers. Um, so that we only give them a feature when it's fully ready. Uh, we can understand unknown risks by doing progressive rollouts. And I'll explain this more later about blast radius of change. Um, you know, I hinted at it. We can experiment. We, we can do A-B testing. Um, do, which of the implementations performs better? You know, does having a red button or a blue button drive more user interaction? Um, does the system behave better with a new sorting algorithm versus the old one. Or maybe we've got some marketing logic and we need to turn it off. Maybe we've tried this feature and it's causing load on the system that's going to take it down so we can turn off that feature right away. So we have a kill switch. Um, that leads us to deployment versus release. And I, I bring this up early in talking about feature flags because I feel there's differences that, that really need to be highlighted. Um, deployment is really the act of putting code on the server. And once you have that methodology down, when you have DevOps, when you have uh, pipelines in place, when you have automation, it's very low risk. It's, re it's repeatable. It's routine. We know how to put code on servers. We know how to deploy it out to production. We can even automate database things. We can automate networking and API integrations. All of that stuff can be automated and routine. 
a lot of times the fear of deployment comes from the fear of exposing new features or new code changes to customers. So let's dive into that. Deployment is low risk, it's repeatable, we do it in production, but that doesn't mean we're opening up features. Um, you know, especially if we have the feature flag turned off or we don't have an integration enabled, we're fine. Um, that feature is not being used. Now release, this is where things get higher risk. This is the thing people kind of pull back from many times. And releases usually are driven by business decisions. We wanna make a big announcement that our new website's going live. We're gonna roll out this new feature. Those are business decisions that a product owner has been pushing for, for, for weeks, potentially months. So by turning on a feature in a release, then we allow users to get access to that feature. But this also lets us experiment. You know, in our routine deployments, we could deploy, you know, features that we want to test. And so we could selectively turn it on and off to beta users or internal users. You know, th this is now that blast radius of change that I mentioned earlier. You know, there's been many times people have deployed code and found out there was a problem found out configuration wasn't right, found out there was a logic problem or things didn't work as expected. Um, usually by, by starting small and then expanding outwards, you can catch those bigger mistakes before anyone even notices. Um, so by limiting that blast radius of change by maybe selectively releasing a feature to 10% um, to classes of users, you, you can um, reduce that risk greatly. And this all ties into that point from before, operationalizing flags. So this is where we've added that if into our code, but now how do we, how do we control it? How do we know that we want to turn it on and off? Are we going to do it manually? Every time we want to toggle the flag, we check in code. Are we going to put a, a file on a server that lets it know that that has the release and no other server has the release? Are we going to do it per user? So add some logic into a database so that the user is, they have it or they don't, on or off. Or are we gonna have some sort of control mechanism, some sort of interface or website or tooling where we can turn it on or off? This is where now we've got some logic around feature flags. We've got a feature flag management service and we can at runtime maybe determine do we want it on or off per user, per some, sort of functionality, some feature, um, maybe some parameter or attribute of the user. And we can toggle how we want to um, implement that feature. So as we work with them, you know, there's different classes of feature flags. Some of them are short term. They're used just to implement new features. You know, it takes a few check-ins, a, a few sprints to implement a feature. So we're going to use a feature flag to hide that implementation until we're ready. Or maybe we want to add an experiment into our code and use the feature flag to figure out which way we want to go. Um, because these are short-term flags, they can really be anywhere in the code, ba code base. Um, this can lead to some complexity because it can hide them somewhere that you might not be expecting to look or you might be digging through code and see a feature flag in and not necessarily know what it's used for. Um, they should definitely be cleaned up after any rollout or experiment. They should be deprecated and then they should be removed um, once that feature is fully live for everyone. But then there's some other things that are, are very similar to flags that are sometimes business logic. Um, this is long-term flags. You know, I've seen these in cases where it's used for licensing, which is an aspect of business logic, but also... Are you a trial user? Are you a pro user? Um, maybe that's where the maybe access to advanced features come in, or you've you've paid for an ad. And the logic is very similar between the two, but uh, it's very easy also to over rely on them. Uh, feature flags can be used for integrations. Maybe you're you're implementing a new payment system. Uh, you you take credit card, and now maybe you want to take some sort of uh, online payment like PayPal. And that might be something that you turn on and off as you're working on the integration. Um, maybe load management. Um, I, I made an example earlier of maybe some marketing logic. 
let's say you have an e-commerce site and the marketing engine will make recommendations based on your previous purchases. That could be a pretty intensive scenario, uh, combing through previous orders, looking at stuff in stock or on sale. You know, when your system is under load, having all of that extra marketing processing might slow down requests to make it a poor experience for people. You could automatically turn off those marketing features when load gets to a certain point. Um, that way there's less load on the system and you can handle more users and then you can automatically turn it back on later as the load goes down. Feature flags do have downsides. They're technical debt. As soon as you add feature flags into your code, you're adding technical debt. You're adding ifs, you're adding old implementations, new implementations, you're increasing complexity. Um, and especially as you start debugging through multiple different environments, that can make it harder to support and debug the system. What's the configuration right now? What's in QA? What's in production? What's in dev? Have you tested how these two flags interact? So th those can all be downsides to having flags. And I did mention targeting. Well, there's lots of options around targeting. Uh, maybe certain times. You know, may maybe during rush hour, we turn off certain pieces of the site and overnight we turn them back on. Uh, maybe regional. Um, you know, if you're in the, the US, you might get certain types of messaging. If you're in EMEA, you might get different types of messaging or APAC. Um, that can really vary based on uh, which region you're in. Are you an administrative user or are you a, you know, non-signed in person? Now, that might not necessarily be feature flags. That might be business logic, but it also could be, you know, determined by how you're implementing it or how you're using it. Um, you know, as you do those rollouts, as we're trying to limit that blast radius of change, we can control the percentage of users that get our flag. Um, so if we're doing a UI change, maybe it's 50-50 and we want to see which one works better. Uh, maybe if we're rolling out a big new feature, you know, we start out with 10% and then 20 and 30 and we do that progressive rollout. Um, we can use feature flags to automatically trigger based on failures or based on load, as I mentioned earlier. And finally, there are, there are some best practices I've definitely seen, and I want to talk about these um, before I get into the demos. Um, have a consistent naming convention. Um, doesn't matter if it's short-term flag or a long-term flag. Have a naming convention so that when someone sees it, they know it's a feature flag and it's identifiable. Have meaningful names with descriptions. I mean we're not dealing with languages that are extremely limited in in variable name length so let's use it to make it very very clear what it's for have a central location for flags so that you can easily find the flags that are supported by the system um, it prevents accidentally reusing or conflicts and all of those flags should be shared either from the development team or automatically through a system so that configurations can be reviewed and everyone is on board with what the system looks like. And finally, I have an example at the bottom of don't ever repurpose a feature flag. Uh, this is a great article from uh, Doug Seven, uh, Seven uh, Nightmare, a DevOps cautionary tale. Uh, this is the story of Knight Capital, which was like a $400 million investment company and they reused a feature flag and it led to um, essentially an out of control um, buying spree and ended up bankrupting the company. Uh, it triggered some logic they weren't expecting and it got into a, a bad state. And um, it, it's just a good example. I, I, it's a really entertaining story and I would suggest you read it. Now this whole time we've been talking about feature flags, um, we haven't really talked about data. I mean why would we? But all applications use data in some way, pretty much. And so as you start changing the shape and logic of your application, the shape of your data might change and you can run into some pitfalls. And I wanted to just point those out before I got into the code. One, always be additive. If you have a number of fields and you need to change uh, the type of or schema of, of one of those fields, don't. Because as soon as you change it uh, and deploy that code out, all the other code breaks. 
the better way I've found is to add a new field with a descriptive name and it might be a very similar name to the previous one but you can add a new field with the right type or schema and maybe have a trigger to automatically copy or upload uh, update the data but that way the old code and the new code can coexist together uh, maybe the old code talking to the old field and the new code talking to the new field and you can deprecate that older field it can run for as long as you need to and as soon as everybody's converted over to the new code you've got that schema deployed everywhere for data you've got the new code deployed everywhere and you've accepted that feature is not going to be turned off remove the feature flag go remove the obsolete fields and you have a safe way to update your data models without breaking integrations this applies to JSON fields as well um, especially if you have outside um, integrations so let's get into some demos and normally I ask if there's questions at the end but since this is a webinar uh, we're not gonna be doing that so let me go ahead and close this all right so um, I have out on my github a, a feature flags repository and this has three examples and we're gonna walk through them uh, we have an Azure app config uh, which is following the quick quick start model we have one that has a full dynamic uh, updating uh, in place and then we have launch darkly now all of these are you know if you want to come out here and look I've got uh, bicep to deploy them through infrastructure as code I've got the app config and I even show you how you can set a flag inside Azure app config and, and we're gonna dive into that and, and show it in a second and then I have um, workflows to to build out and deploy these .NET apps into Azure so um, I'm an Azure guy and so I have a resource for feature flags out in Azure uh, a resource group this is in the Azure portal and I've created an Azure app config now Azure app config is pretty awesome it can be used to do a large number of uh, configurations we, we, we can set all sorts of um, key value pairs we can use tags for environments but we're using the feature uh, manager um, functionality and this is where you can add uh, feature flags you can give them uh, a name you can give them a description and you can apply labels as well um, you can also as I talked about in the slides you can target uh, based on uh, percentages groups individual users you can use uh, times or you can actually write your own code and implement a custom filter based on you know the percentage or targeting or time window uh, based classes so you have a lot of that functionality and um, it's very well I think documented out in the docs.microsoft site um, I'm a huge fan of, of docs.microsoft uh, long before <laughs> I became an employee here um, I think that their examples and graphics and discussion are, are just absolutely phenomenal. Um, so for my example, I'm using .NET, but there are quick starts available for Node, Python, Java, uh, a wide range of languages and um, settings and configurations. So let's look at our code. Um, so I'm going to look at the uh, quick start and I will increase the size a little bit so when you're implementing Azure app config I've added really uh, one or two little um, class libraries uh, NuGet packages for app config the Microsoft Azure app configuration ASP core and feature management ASP core um, I've just added those into my project and if you can see right here this is in the the program startup this is the where the web host gets defined and we've got configure Azure app config that that is the helper method it's actually going to kind of wire in Azure app config into the configuration system of dotnet um, I'm using dotnet 5 that's very similar with dotnet core 3.1 um, very similar to net 6 uh, with some small tweaks because they, they, they've changed the, the layout but you can see I'm getting a connection string out of my settings and then I'm adding in Azure app config 
using that connection and I'm using the use feature flags helper class to uh, enable uh, feature flags. Uh, don't really have much in startup other than I'm going to, to add feature management. Uh, and I'll show what this does because I love how well feature flags integrate into .NET. Um, so let's look at a controller. You know, I've got this home controller here. Um, it just looks normal. Uh, there's no logic here. There's nothing in here really about Azure App Config or feature flags. So oh, our index just returns a view. So let's go take a look at our view. Um, and in our shared layout, this is where some interesting things start to happen. See, I've got a feature name here, beta. So it knows if my feature beta is on to render out this content. And if this feature beta is off to not render out this content. So it, it's aware of uh, razor syntax and HTML. Um, let's take a quick look back at my app config. So right now it's off. So um, I've got this uh, website running in Azure right now. So let, let's go to it and I will. So here's our quick start. So right now this is off. I don't see beta anywhere. Let me go ahead and turn this on. So it's now updated and refresh my page. Nothing happened. Let me explain why. So in this scenario uh, with the, the quick start setup, the um, ASP configuration system reads in what the flags look like one time and then it starts the application. So if I restart this now and give it a sec to restart, it'll reread in that new configuration that beta is turned on. And now um, once it restarts and I refresh the page, um, beta will be active. It just takes it a sec to, to, to restart the application. Right. Oh, there we go. We got, a, we got a little spinny. As it restarts the application. And see now beta is there. So I had to restart the application with the quick start. Um, another thing that is important to note besides just rendering out HTML, uh, the feature management syntax that comes in um, feature management from the Azure and Microsoft Teams is it gives you these feature gates. And these feature gates allow you to hide and block endpoints um, so not only will it not render it out, if you try calling this while the flag is off, it will just return like a not found, like it won't respond to that endpoint at, at all. So we've got basic implementation of feature flags. It's, it's awesome, but that's not where things get fun because we keep having to restart things. So, you know, let's look at this one. We've got the same feature gate. We've got the, the same home controller in this dynamic uh, project. Um, and if I come down here into my programs, things are a little different. So in this case, we're still getting our connection string. We're still connecting, but we configured a refresh. We said pretty much refresh every five seconds. Register this beta key and refresh it um, every five seconds. There's a great documentation on this, but so now we've kind of enabled our application to be able to dynamically respond more quickly and if we turn on and offer a feature flag. So let's actually go over to that application just to see it running live. 
All right. So we see the flag is on. I've got them both linked to the same flag. So if I turn this off, successfully off. And so now within about five seconds, what we should see is the beta flag should disappear. Let's not click it for five or six seconds just to <laughs> make sure that it will uh, not cache anything. Ah, I think I'm getting impatient. But um, this is a much friendlier configuration um, to deal with. There we go. It's gone. Um, then restarting your application every time you want to tar toggle something. Um, and just diving back in quickly, um, what I have done on these sites is I have under my configuration, I have a connection string um, for my Azure app config. That was all generated through infrastructure as code. I don't know anything around the um, yeah, so it, it generates an Azure app config and then I'm putting that connection string um, as the app config right into the site when it gets built. There are other ways. Uh, we support managed identities. So you can set up an identity for the website and have it connect to the app config and it just needs to know the endpoint name, like the name of the app config, nothing else around it no identities, no passwords, anything like that. So you can set up managed identities to connect between these two. Um, I just wanted to show that because it, it, it is a great um, set of functionality. Um, you can, there's a primary and secondary key and what you can actually do is have read only ones. You can have your apps that only uh, read in keys and maybe your DevOps system. Uh, Azure App Config integrates really nicely with uh, GitHub Actions and Azure DevOps, so you can have those having uh, read-write access and um, your applications having read-only access. Uh, you can uh, export out your configurations, you can restore settings, um, and then there are some, you know, alerting, metrics, logging. There's a lot of great capabilities uh, with this, as well as, you know, looking at when they're being accessed and used. So I, I'm, I'm a big fan of this service. Um, and before I dive over into LaunchDarkly, so looking at this documentation here, uh, I just want to highlight it again. Um, there are some tutorials here uh, integrating with Key Vault. Please do not store secret information inside Azure App Config. Um, there is a way uh, right here where you can have uh, Azure App Config kind of proxy through to Key Vault. You would still need a Key Vault, still need an App Config, but it, it allows you to um, have configuration tied back to Key Vault uh, secrets. Yeah, reloading certificates automatically. Uh, going through CI/CD, this stuff is is really awesome. Um, a lot of great examples, a lot of great documentation, and um, a lot of great samples out on uh, GitHub. So please look into that. I, I think it's a a really nice uh, implementation of feature flags. Now, the other implementation I have is LaunchDarkly. So LaunchDarkly also has an SDK. Um, in this particular case, it's called the LaunchDarkly.Server SDK. Um, th there's a client-side SDK as well as a server-side SDK for LaunchDarkly. Um, they recommend um, in this that you have a singleton um, if you implement an LD client. So the LD client is the LaunchDarkly client. Um, I'm telling it to get the string out of the the configuration and implement a LaunchDarkly client. That is added into the dependency injection and in the different controllers like this you can identify users and you can evaluate um, different flags. Um, again, I know, magic strings. This does not integrate as nicely, um, I would say, 
as the the markdown. Like if you're doing back end code, front end code, no problems at all. Um, I had to do you know like some view bag um, if it's enabled to render or not render um, out the field. But as far as integration with the back end code, yeah, you you can you can easily evaluate pretty much any of the flags very quickly. Um, to access this, to access launch darkly, they do not use a um, connection string to a system like uh, Azure App Config. It uses an SDK key. SDK key. Um, you get that from the launch darkly website. So this is uh, launch darkly. I've got a project um, which has two environments and I've got my beta flag. Um, you know, let me go back out and bring up my site. So we've got the site up. We've got that beta flag on. It looks very similar. Um, I'm going to turn this off. And you can request approval. You can schedule changes. I'm going to save this with a comment. You know, I'm turning this off for demo. This is my production environment. It's been done. F5, it, it's taken out. Uh, Launch Darkly prides themselves on speed of resolution um, of, you know, evaluation. Uh, they do have a lot of other um, similar capabilities. Um, you know, does this depend on another flag? Is there a pre res quit flag? Um, do we want to target certain users? Um, right now I'm using one called default email address. Do we want to target people that have been through the site that have a certain email address in here and we say, yes, they get this one. No, they don't get this one. Do we want to do some of that segregation based on you know, various properties, just like we can do with the uh, Azure App Config. Um, so all of those are there, and you know I have my default rule, or I can do some sort of percentage. Um, so very similar capabilities across the board. Uh, just like with Azure App Config, where we could see our key evaluations, um, this also breaks it down a little bit by uh, which way it evaluates. Um, it provides you with some experimentation capabilities. You can look into um, variations based on environments. You can see the history of if it's turned on or off. And they do have this capability. I've tried getting it, it working. Uh, I've run into some issues, but um, you're supposed to be able to run a code scan on your, your code and look for uh, code references in your code base and and I'll just go to the documentation to show you uh, it, it, it's supposed to scan and integrate with GitLab and GitHub and Circle and Bitbucket but I mentioned that technical debt as soon as you add a feature flag into your code or technical debt well this is um, supposed to help you identify where in your code those code references are and list them out on the page so that you can know when you can safely remove that code um, that feature flag from your code base. Uh, it's very nice. Um, you can see users across all your environments and how they've been seen. You can, you know, break down your segments and your experiments. Um, it's, it's a good, uh, system. They're both very good systems. And, um, um, I highly recommend both of them. And so, that brings us to the end. I want to thank everyone for their time. Um, I will be available online um, at all of those addresses I shared before. And uh, thank you very much uh, for the time today.